Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hypnosis Everywhere. And with me today is, of course, my psychic, Martin Gover, off, off as far as he can get away. I just think he went to the kitchen. <laughs> and with us is Reverend Timothy Jones, and this is going to be a great program. So first, Reverend Jones, I would like you just to tell people a little bit of your background, bio, and maybe how you came to hypnosis. Well, it's a long and involved one. Um, I uh, spent uh, 28 years as a uh, police officer and a private investigator. And then in the year 2000, my stepson died, which uh, shook me to the core. And it was a significant life experience. And I, and I realized I wasn't happy with the way I was living. So I um, had learned forensic hypnosis a number of years before to help refresh witness memories. And I thought, you know what, why don't I go, why don't I go back into counseling, so, which is where I originally trained. So I uh, retrained. And then, um, and then, so I used my forensic hypnosis and switched it to clinical hypnosis, started to work with people. And I worked in a psychotherapy clinic. And then, and then I, I remembered why I, I didn't like doing it anymore, because people were coming in for nine months at a time. And we're doing CBT. That was the main approach of cognitive behavioral therapy. And clients were coming in and talking the talk better than I was talking the talk because of being you know, so many different therapists. Yeah. So I started to, I thought, well, let's just not tell them and I'll do this. And I started to do hypnosis. And then I was kicking people out in 12 sessions rather than nine months. Oh. And they were all happy. And things were, were getting done and the lives were changing. And, um, you know, the, to, to, the, to the advantage of the, therapy of the psychotherapy clinic where I was rather than kicking me out because I was now a uh, competition to them. They kept me and they started to uh, refer people to me. So now I was getting truly disturbed people <laughs> who had been going to see psychotherapists for like a lifetime sort of thing. And, um, you know, you had to think on your feet. I had to think pretty quickly. And there's a lot of asking, please help me God. But, um, you know, we, we got through it and, and it taught me the lesson that anybody's mind can do anything that you, then it sets itself to. And the body can take all sorts of punishment once the mind decides that you can do it. Uh, so the body is, and the mind are, are two separate things. So, um, um, and, and also as a result of my stepson dying, I, um, I wanted to get some real education in um in counseling and grief counseling and when i did when i investigated i found that the best grief counseling you're ever going to get is in seminary so i enrolled i went through then i went through qualifying a bunch of those and finally chose one seminary in the u.s and um i had to go down there every year uh for uh, for a couple of weeks but it was all distance and i and that, and they didn't talk about uh, any distracting courses uh it was like straight straight counseling that's all it was and i uh, came out of that and um decided that this is where i was going to stay and then along the way using hypnosis and um and working with these people all of a sudden i came across uh energy attachments while i was doing um ego uh, ego therapy work and you probably want to ask what that is, but um, that's where I became familiar with ghosts, whether they're dead or alive. And I like I have absolutely no fear of ghosts whatsoever, even. And I, I've never had them, but people say, "Oh, you know, if you come over to my house, there's this big, the big scary monster, and it makes everybody scared, and and your know, cupboards open and close, and you know, it's like a movie." And I, you know, and I, and I, I say, I don't have to come to your house. Let me just turn my mind to it. And we find out that it's not some big, scary. Thing. Let me let me give you an example. There was a, a medium in, in Britain who wrote about this. And uh, a friend of the mediums um, noticed that when guests stayed in one particular bedroom in her house, that there was an apparition that appeared uh, usually every night, scary you know, and I'm present and, and like, you know, I mean, negative, negative vibrations and people would flee the room and say, I'm never going to stay in that room again. 
So um, this medium, who was a friend of the owner, said, oh, that's baloney here. I'll stay for the night. So they went and stayed. And sure enough, this apparition appeared and, and tried its best to rattle its chains and to scare him. So the, the medium, who was irritated at being woken up to start off with, in a very bad mood, said, what, do you, what the hell do you think you're doing? Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> And then once the spirit realized that it could be seen or it was being perceived by a human, it changed, uh, it shrunk down into a little old man bent over. And um, so the, the medium felt sort of badly for raising his voice at him and said, what is it that I can help you with? What is it that you're looking for? And the spirit said, my bones, my bones are in the backyard and, and they shouldn't be there. They should be with my grave. And, and uh, I don't know the details of the story, but apparently his bones were buried in the backyard of this house. They were trying to get people's attention to tell him he wanted his bones to go to where his tomb was or to where his uh, casket was or where his grave was. And then he would be happy. Um, so uh, as I understand, they dug up the backyard, they found him and they uh, Police investigated and found uh, apparently no problem. They took the bones and they interred them with the rest of his body and everybody lived happily ever after. But I mean, that's, that's indicative, you know, because you have not ever heard of a mother not tell you, I don't know what it is, but at night, my son cries and screams and he comes and he says there's a monster in his room. I mean, in essence, that's all it is. It's a spirit that hasn't gone all the way. Which, which opens the door to, you know, what do you mean it hasn't gone all the way? It's a spirit that hasn't gone all the way and it's, tr it's trying to get people's attention. That's all it is. And, and, and when, you know, a spirit goes um, through a number of experiences where people, where, where it's not perceived, it becomes angry, frustrated, mm -hmm. and it becomes angry and it uses its energy to, to move itself into an even uh, more different or more startling shape to get people's attention. But if you're not a medium or you're not an intuitive, it doesn't matter how crazy you are. I mean, maybe the vibration is gonna make you very scared at night if you're open to it that little bit, but nobody can say, what is it that I can help you with unless they're trained as an intuitive. And there is training that's available out there that people should take advantage of. But what's happening is that every single human being has intuition. And every single human being can have that intuition trained. It's like going to gym and working the muscles. Now, you're not going to get the big guns unless you uh, do uh, curls. And it's the very same with intuition. You have to practice it. Now, I was very, very lucky because uh, 28 years as an investigator, um, you develop a certain intuition anyway. Um, but I went to a chapter meeting for, um, for a friend of uh, yours and mine, Peggy Kelly Davies, mm -hmm. who was having a chapter meeting. Um, um, so I, she said, I'm having a medium. Uh, a psychic and a medium over to come talk. Maybe you want to come. I said, yeah, I'll come. Because I, I didn't really buy into that all that much. And you know, sort of, even though I knew I had a rudimentary sense of, you know, detective um, intuitions. So I went. And one of the things that this woman talked about, her name was um, Carolyn Molnar. One of the things she talked about was that uh, she teaches people. So she'll take you on as a psychic for six months. And if you've got psychic skills, then she'll move you into the medium class where you can stay. So um, I said to Peggy uh, on the quiet, I said, you know what, baby? If she's lying, I'm going to find out. So I thought, <laughs> <laughs> uh, before you keep going there, I'm just going to say one thing. And I don't think it's kind of funny to us because you really know it. But the chapter meeting is not wasn't for witches. It was for hypnotists. So I'm just going to okay, say well, that. I mean, sure, sure, whatever, I, this, whatever we are. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I went to um, I went to uh, train with her, uh, and, and and I stayed with her for six years. And uh, every two weeks, uh, eight or twelve of us would get together and we would uh, do exercises to raise our intuition. But all those exercises were preceded. They called it by meditation. Yeah. Was preceded by going into state. Yeah. So one particular point, I spoke to uh, spoke to her, the instructor, and I said, listen, why don't you let me take everybody? And I said, why don't you let me lead them into meditation? Because meditation, at the base of meditation, is hypnosis. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And still people either don't know that, ignore it, or forget it. But there would be no meditation if there wasn't hypnosis. And it slays me. And people say, oh, I go to meditation. It's taken me six weeks to uh, learn how to uh, focus on the candle. I go, come to me. I mean, I can have, within three minutes, I can have you in the very same state. And you can take it and do what whatever you like with anyway, practice things, rehearse things, find peace, whatever you want. Um, because it's hard um, to just come in from the meditative side. So um, she said, okay, uh, tonight uh, Reverend Tim is going to um, uh, lead you all into a place. So I took them all to a beach and then I gave them a suggestion that, and it was straight hypnosis. I kind of did a 10 count from 10 down and out, down to one. And when we got the one, we got on the beach and I deepened them a little more. Every step they took, they went even deeper and become even more relaxed. And I left them with suggestion that while they were here, they would um, find the answers they were looking for, for what they came here tonight for. And then um, I, just, I just left them do what they had to do. And it was up to the instructor to bring them back to full awareness when the meditative time was up, which he did. And afterwards, I mean, a couple of people said, wow, you know, you just like plonked me right in the middle of that one. It was like, it was really effective. Um, so to take it a step further, so I, um, I specialize in parts therapy or uh, ego state therapy. That, that is that um, in all, most of the problems, the vast majority of problems that people have that they go to psychotherapists for or anybody else have, have developed prepubescently. Everything happened before. So for example, your mother says to you, uh, you know, oh, Inez, I mean, you stop singing. I mean, you're you're scaring the cats. You can't sing. <laughs> You'll never be able to sing. Stop. That so really you grew happened. up. With... <laughs> you scared the cats. No, so just you my grew mother. Up with a belief... <laughs> you grew up with a belief that you can't sing, even though you could be, uh, you know, a songbird after after puberty. You know, which is where all the all the great changes take place. So um, uh, what happens is that people carry things that happen prepubescently, and they don't understand why they feel this way, why I feel that way, because parents and parents are, you know, are, are exerting a discipline that live, they learn from their parents, which are 50, 60, 70 years old, because they learn from their parents. So now we're getting into 100-year-old discipline, which they learn from their parents, which derive from like 150-year-old disciplinary techniques and philosophies that don't, they don't apply anymore. So uh, that's why that's why youth um, uh, that's why youth sort of rebel and all sorts of stuff. So um, when I with parts therapy, and I'll talk more about how ghosts come out of it, but with parts therapy, what's really really effective is that um, I will uh, go into a part of them that says I'm chewing my nails and ask the part that that, that chews the nails. Why are you doing this? We'll negotiate and tell her what the situation is. Because just because they're older doesn't mean that the part grew up with them and doesn't understand that this is destroying their social life or their work life because they don't they don't look present to their, as as professionally as they would have, could have. And and the part who, which is there to protect the individual will say, oh, okay, well I'll stop doing that. And when it stops doing that. Then, we, then we've got to give it another job to do or ask it what else it would like to do. And uh, from there, when I was dealing with parts, all of a sudden I found that some parts were actually energy attachments or ghosts that had attached to the person in a time of stress. Mm -hmm. so I understand that uh, you've got a break coming up and you want to talk about it after that? Uh, not. we got about at least two and a half minutes left. So. Oh, well, that I can do all sorts of stuff in two and a half minutes. Here we go. <laughs> So, um, um, and I knew about attachments and what happens is that, for example, if you take this situation, here's a young man who's got a motorcycle. It's his first uh, summer job. He got bought a motorcycle. He's driving along the highway and he's not looking and he goes in the back of a tractor trailer. So all of a sudden, um, you know, he dies instantly and the, and the soul of the body is confused. So the soul says, well, you know, what happened? What happened? And, and everybody stops and tries to help. And, and the soul will go over and try to tap people on the shoulder and say, excuse me, that's my body. Excuse me, that's my motorcycle. 
But if they're not mediums or they're not intuitives that are trained, they can't perceive what the soul is doing or saying. And if they think that's all baloney, how many times have you walked into a room and said, I swear that your mother is here? <laughs> because <laughs> there's something that's happening in the room. We all have perception. Um, but they, then, then on top of that, put a, um, an EMT, emergency medical technician, who's working on the body, and he's been working double shifts. He uh, hasn't slept in, that, in you don't know how long. He hasn't been home in a how long sort of thing. And the, um, and the soul goes over, and, or ghost, soul, ghost, soul, soul, ghost, goes over and touches them in the shoulder and says, excuse me, that's my, my body. And then when they touch them, they realize that this individual is a lot like them. They like to have beer, you know, 19 year old and, you know, sort of thing. And they like them and they get attached to them energetically from an ener energy point of view, because there's ener the center the soul has no substance. It doesn't weigh anything. It doesn't, it just, they get attached to them. And when they're attached to them, um, what happens is that, um, the other person may start to exhibit some of their personality characteristics, which is how we fix with hypnosis. So we'll talk about that after the break. Okay, so now we're going to go to break and we'll see you on the other side. Roger. You're listening to Hypnosis Everywhere, The Simpson Protocol. To reach the show today, send an email to Inez, that's I-N-E-S, at InezSimpson.com. Now, back to this week's program. Well, welcome back, and we're going to just go right back to the stories because I don't want to waste any time on my end here. So just take off where you went. Well, there's, uh, um, you know, if, if, if there's any... Um, if notes of practitioners out there who have not trained in parts therapy or ego state therapy, I mean, you really deserve to get yourself out there and learn because it's very quick, very fast, very deep. I'll give you an example. So uh, somebody, a client may come in and say, you know what? I mean, I can't help getting angry at the stupidest things. I don't know what it is. I've, it's always been with me. I've always been an angry person. So um, we go into their subconscious and uh, we ask for the part of them. So I'll say, I'm asking for the part in Larry that controls anger to come forward and talk to us, please. And, and we can only do it through hypnosis. So, um, and I'll ask for idio motor signaling. So I'll say, um, when you're here, and ready to talk to us, raise a yes finger. So they'll go like that. I'll say, okay, Larry, thank you very much for coming forward and talking to us. And um, I'll ask it, uh, because I need to identify it, I'll say, if you had to look in a mirror, um, what color are, would be reflected back to you? What color are you? And if they tell me they're black, then I know that I've got something substantial to deal with. <laughs> if they tell me they're flaming red, then I think, oh, we <laughs> got some anger to go on here. And then there's other, all sorts of other colors, uh, green and blue and light blue, dark blue, uh, yellow. I mean, and there's some like really, really negative ones that are yellow, tell you the truth. That's why I have to qualify with them. <clears throat> so um, we ask them where they live in the body. For example, if they live in the heart, or they live in the chest, or they live in the leg, or the knee, or the brain, it could be that that's where there are some physical uh, things happening. And as they react to different things, it reacts in the area that they're living. And, um, and ask them how long they've been there um, now. A part is supposed, to, a legitimate part is supposed to say, oh, forever, since the very beginning. Or they'll say, um, I, I don't, I don't know. In which case we can, we can regress them the same as we would do anything else and say, well, listen, Larry, I'm going to regress you. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to count from five down to one or seven down to one or whatever. And when I say the number one and uh, tap Larry's at the back of his wrist like this, you'll be um, uh, where you first came into this body when you first became active. So five, four, three, two, one, where are you? What's happening? Are you inside? Are you outside? You go through the protocol. Um, and if they say, I've always been here. I just, I, just, I just never grew until something happened. And then we go through that experience. And that's what happened that caused them anger to raise. And they don't usually start as anger. 
they usually start as uh, they're offended. And then uh, anger comes over a period of time because it, the, the offense to the subconscious keeps on happening and happening and happening by somebody who's treating them that way through the conscious through, into the subconscious. So um, parts are really powerful because we can say to this part, we can say, oh, listen, brown or whatever color, and I'll go say, can, can I call you brown, Larry? Yeah, okay. Uh, and if, uh, if I know it's a part, then we negotiate with it and say, listen to what's happening in, in Larry's life is that he's becoming angry at a lot of different things and things that shouldn't be angry. And we go through the whole scenario, we sum it up and, and say, is there a chance, Brown, do you think that you might be able to withdraw on the, on the overt anger seeing the situation? Because bear in mind that parts, not all parts grow up with a person chronologically. A part could be exhibiting the very same response that they did when it, when it first came up, when it first developed. Um, and it hasn't changed at all. And that's like finger biting. That's a, a prime example. They just don't change uh, because they don't know. So we tell them what they don't know, that anger was ruining this person's life and can you change it? We give them some suggestions and say, you know, is there another role that you would like that you can see yourself doing instead of being angry at every step? And, um, and to their credit, they'll sit back and they'll say, um, yes, it is, it is an awful lot of work. I mean, they'll tell you. They'll say, yes, it is an awful lot of work. And, uh, and, and now the door is open and say, is there another part that helps you? Is, or is there something else that you'd like to come help you? And they say, well, yellow helps me every once in a while. So I'll say, listen, Brown, stay where you are, please. And I'll bring yellow in and, and ask yellow how it helps and what it does. And, and yellow is usually, well, I, you know, I, I try to help him sometimes because I understand that he shouldn't be angry all the time. And then we find out what yellow's reason, uh, raison d'etre is to, to be there. So we negotiate back and forth. However, uh, much to my surprise, one day, so I'm, so I'm qualifying with the questions, what do you do, how long to be in here, the, um, um, and then I said, I don't know why, I said, my instinct told me, and I said to this one part, I said, um, have you ever had a body of your own, purple? And it said, uh, yes. And I said, oh, what was your name, purple? Oh, it was John Butler. Well, you know what, parts don't have names. Um, like Christian names, like people names. Their names are emotional names. It's either I'm anger or I'm happy or I'm, there's, there's one client ahead. And we both burst out laughing. She's deep in hypnosis. And I said, and, and what's your name? She said, I'm not, and I said, and what do you do? She says, I'm the little liar. <laughs> well, that's attractive, the women, my clients, attractive women had developed this part, who was the little liar, who said, my telephone number? Of course you can, here you go, and give them the wrong telephone number, <laughs> or something like that. But it was a defensive mechanism, because guys were coming on to her because of her looks. And she just delighted in saying, I'm the little liar. <laughs> so we both were sitting here, peals of laughter. She's deep in hypnosis laughing away. So don't think that you can't have fun. So how um, was John Butler doing? Uh, so, um, then, so, so I, I remember saying, why did you come in? Were you invited or did you just come in? Uh, and they'll say, no, no, they wanted me to come in. They invited me. And I had another client as an example who remembers as a little girl. Uh, I think she was six or no, she was nine and, and her parents are going through a separation. So she remembers sitting on the cool school steps after school one day in pure frustration and just crying and saying, won't anybody please come and help me? And this spirit was uh, coming by and uh, came in and stayed with her. Stayed with her until the time when we got together, which was, oh, it was only like a year ago, you know, sort of thing And she's in her uh, late forties now. So all her life, this, this other spirit had been helping her long past the time when she needed any help. Um, so um, I explained to John uh, that after going through the process and that uh, it's against karma to live in somebody else's energy. Um, and this is not the proper thing to do. And um, there are your family and friends are waiting for you who love you. 
are waiting for you in another place. Now, can I, can I help you go there? Do you want to go there? And they, well, for me, everybody different. I always ask, would you like to go there? Can I help you go there? And they say, no, I like it here. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, and they're screwing up somebody's life. Then I will ask uh, Archangel Michael to come help because he's the warrior. And Archangel Michael has told me, um, you can call me anytime. There is nobody I can't handle. And they will come, Archangel Michael will come and take them to where they belong in the universe. And it's funny sometimes because I've, I've said, to, uh, I've said to, to them, tell me what's happening as Archangel Michael is helping this John to where it belongs, tell me what's happening. And the client will say, um, and they'll, they'll, another voice will come out and they'll say, hey, hey, take your hands off me. Hey, leave me alone. What happens is people think because they call an Archangel Michael that he comes in and boom with a flash of thunder and uh, with God's authority, <laughs> comes and gets him, boom, away, you're gone. It doesn't happen that way. What happens is when spirit comes in, they only use as much force as is necessary. So Archangel Michael will come in with his, his warriors and they will, they will just grab him by the arm and say, come with us, dear one. And um, sometimes I'll protest. And, and, and if I ask for an audit as we're going along, tell me what's happening, tell me what, what and, and then and I've, I had clients say, oh, they're, it's a, quite a tussle. Oh, they're, and their eyes are closed and say, they're, at the, oh, they're up by the corner of the room now. It's like, okay, they're gone now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, you and I have both had experiences in that realm, but there's some things that I, I'm still uh, not happy with when other people, I think we do that in a very gentle way. We do it honoring both sides of the coin, as I would say, right? Yeah. And from, you know, the movies, you get this whole thing about how exorcism is done is get them angry, fight them, do this. Yeah, it's just like, and whatever the reality of that is, yeah, I think it's very detrimental to both sides. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, so maybe you can address a little bit of what you yeah, think about yeah. It used to be taught <clears throat> when you're learning how to clear energies. It used to be taught that we would, um, once we found them, we'd say, "All right, we've uh, we found you now. We know where you are, so you might as well just give it up." And then we'd call in Archangel Michael. Well, you know, talk about getting PO'd. I mean, you're not getting much respect. So you've been caught. We're we're gonna do what we have to do with you. The 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 the, the approach has much changed now uh, over the last four. Or four Five years from now, uh, we um, we're very very gentle with them. We asked them, "Would you like to go and see uh, with the rest of your family?" And if they say no, then I'll silently say, "Archangel Michael, can you come and help me with this?" And sometimes Spirit will prompt me and give me words, but most of the time I rely on them to do what they got to do because they're a lot more powerful than I am. Um, and then I say, "When you get to the look around, what I usually say, look around you." and look for an area that's brighter than any other area. Look for that. And then and you go, and the client goes. <laughs> and I think, oh, Nobody thanks. can see that. Their head goes around looking at something. Their eyes are through closed. eyes, yeah, and it's going, great. Oh, God bless you. So they, um, and then they go like that. And I, I say, if somebody's here to come get you, if you see them, tell me that you, that you see them. They say, I see them. I say, who is it? And if they tell me it's my mother or it's my wife or it's my sister, or I don't know, I think it's an angel. I want to, uh, I want to make sure that um, it's not a dark force that is uh, going to come and waylay them, which is a topic for another show. Um, <laughs> so I will, I will usually um, say, Archangel Michael, will you send your warriors to help Larry or John Butler come from and go through to the light? Um, and then I'll say, uh, what is your mother saying to you now? And they'll say, she's got, telling me to come with her. They go ahead and take her hand then and go with her. And I've already invoked Archangel Michael so that, you know, the dark forces are, are shut out because I've had them come in and try to intrude. And then they go in and as they're going, I say, Larry, thank you very much for what you did for Inez. Take everything that uh, that belongs to you with or with you, and you know you can never come back here. You know that, don't you? Because as they're going, they can still talk to you. They, you know that you can uh, you can never come back here, right? You have another place to go, and they go, yes. And they and I say thank Ns 
for hosting you. And they'll turn around and say, no, thank you, thank you, <laughs> bye, as, as they're being taken to where they belong in the universe. And they, and, they, and they go to literally wherever the universe wants them to go. It's like, I don't say take them to platform B, please. <laughs> okay, so like, it's, it's like, <laughs> they know a lot better than I do. I'm just a reflection. And anything that I do, anything that I get, anything I'm given is just, it's just a mirror. I, it just comes through me. It's not mine. It belongs to yeah. spirits, spirits coming to me here. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this is a much gentler process and people that are uh, sometimes, and what they don't understand that sometimes it isn't just people who had bodies before, or it isn't just an energy of anger or an energy of this, which is most of the time, but every now and then it's just an energy that's really piled up a few of those things and all together created this bigger energy, right? Well, and that's why you have to talk to all the yellows in the brain that you do. Well, I, I mean, the, the question is why are these ghosts around or, or souls? Mm -hmm. That's because they have, um, at the time of death, they either missed the white light they avoided it because they thought, well, I'm being so bad, they're going to send me to hell. And I'm not going. So yeah. they started to float. Or they wanted to stay for revenge. Or they wanted to stay to protect somebody, like a grandparent. Yeah. The, or, you know, there's a whole host of re reasons. Mm -hmm. I use the word host. There's a whole number of reasons yeah. why, they, why they stay and, and why we talk to them. And you know what? I mean, they're, they're like human beings. The first, there's a, there's a very good friend of yours and mine, Ted, when mm -hmm. he died. Mm -hmm. um, I went through my uh, um, I went through um, my channeling teacher, and I said, Elizabeth, you know, I, I need to teach. Uh, I need to speak to Ted. Can you can you open up for me? Because she's much more talented than I am right now until I get more gifts. And uh, Ted came through, and it was like um, uh, it was actually the first time. It was two hours after he uh, transitioned. We were at a conference, and I was uh, they, his his uh, secretary uh, texted me and said Ted's gone, um, and uh, Elizabeth was uh, doing readings, and I interrupted her and said Ted's gone, and, and he came through straight away, and and thanked everybody for for his life and 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 how it wasn't like so I I went back and I wanted to speak to him two days later, and it was like speaking to you. I mean, and he, I said Ted, how are you doing? And he said. Great, he said, you should see the things I can do from up here. <laughs> <laughs> and the voice I knew, I knew it was him. I, there was no choice about it. And I said, and on and on and on, remember that our deal is that when I get there, you're going to greet me with a glass of red wine. And he said, I have no problem. <laughs> But, okay, so uh, we uh, in the we have another three minutes in this segment. So uh, okay, I just want to yeah, yeah, I just want you to finish up Ted thing, especially because you know how much we love each other too. So um, it's kind of nice to hear. So just finish off that story and anything else. So just bringing you up to date how much time you okay, have. with Ted. I mean, <clears throat> um, and then I went back about a month and a half later to speak to him. It's always the same way and they never have the same voice because now they've transitioned into other areas of understanding. They are learning when they're there. They're, um, uh, you know, they're transitioning into uh, where they need to be so they can decide if they're going to if they're going to reincarnate back down, which could be 20 minutes, could be 20 years, could be 30 years, could be a lifetime before they come back down again. They may never. Uh, but the whole idea is that we, we go through this life. It takes about 70 or 80,000 years so we get to the point where our soul is educated enough and our soul matures like human beings do. And we go through the stage of prepubescence and pubescence and middle age and old age. We get to the point where we are wise enough and understanding and loving enough that we can now act as a guide of some type to to others who are living here but um to anybody who says why the hell am i living on this lifetime you're a human being you chose to be here baby and it's like <laughs> you're doing what you chose to do while you're here so enjoy it while you're at it the name of the game is is god god the creator doesn't want us to say oh my god what am i doing he wants we're here to have fun but we're so angry and guilt-ridden, you know, we don't, we go, oh, I should feel angry about feeling good. <laughs> Why? You know, why? You're sent here as a human being. You have free will to do whatever you want to do. 
But the reason you feel angry about feeling good is because of the way that people have raised you and brought you up and they're, they're putting their, excuse my language, they're putting their bullshit on you, which is um, not necessary. But, you know, we could do another three or four shows on, on just what happens <laughs> and, and how through hypnosis we can, um, we can speak to ghosts and, um, and help them help us. Okay, and with that, that was a great ending for that segment, and we'll see everyone on the other side. You're listening to Hypnosis Everywhere, The Simpson Protocol. To reach the show today, send an email to Inez, that's I-N-E-S, at InezSimpson.com. Now, back to this week's program. Well, welcome back, and this is our last segment, so I'm going to shut up and pass it right back to Reverend Tim. Um, I want to tell you a funny story. Um, people say, well, how can I develop this intuition? Everybody has it already. And I'll give you an example. We were in, my wife and I were in Mexico a number of years ago, and we were walking along, we uh, were walking, walking along the beach to go to where they're having an outdoor lunch. And I kept on seeing things appear out of the corner of my eye. And I know what that is, because when spirit is first starting to test you to see if you'll take it, they'll do a little little appearance right out of the corner of your vision and disappear before you fully focus on them. And by that time, I was far, far, far past that. I was like fully trained as a medium and as a psychic. And I'm like, I knew exactly what it was. And I go like, who the hell is that? So we're, <laughs> excuse me if I lose my voice <clears throat> here a minute, but we were walking along and then, and the waiters were um, on the beach were all, uh, they all had their cloth over their arm and they were all wearing um, light uh, beige um, Bermuda shorts and nice golf shirts and I'd come serve sort of beer on the beach and all the rest and um, so all of a sudden I look beside me and there's my, my stepson and he's dressed up as a waiter and he says, uh, Senor, what can I get for you? <laughs> so, I, um, <clears throat> I laugh. And the Myra said, What are you laughing at? And I said, uh, Pat's here. And she goes, <laughs> <laughs> Looking around her, she's not intuitive. And I thought, What are you looking around for? You can't see him. <laughs> but, um, you know, they come to you, but they will only, it's like speaking through a frosted glass window. <clears throat> but the way that you can get around that is simply to train, go to somebody who is. Uh, a legitimate psychic and medium and and runs classes and has for a while and they will run you through the exercises so that, that you'll learn how to increase your intuition and what's the advantage of that it's just not so that we can see ghosts or anything it's it's because once you do that then you can uh, help other people an awful lot more than than you have already the mystery of death disappears so when you think about COVID, and you know, and and there's a lot of things that have happened with COVID. I mean, I've got you're sit, I'm sitting in an office here that's set up the same as a very as a psychotherapeutic office with you know the chair and the sofa and, and you know and all the rest. I can't use it anymore until uh, COVID's finished. I can't use it anymore. So we're using Zoom to uh, to work with clients. Um, but people are scared. I mean, we we're out shopping the other day and people are like. Every time my wife, whether they're both reaching for the apples, or, so you, you don't have to be that way. That there's no reason to think <clears throat> that just because you're around somebody, you know, they're not coughing in your face. I mean, stop the fear. Um, the the fear is there because the politicians love it because media have a story. And my father was a newspaper man all his life. I mean, he he knows all about sensationalism. God may rest in, in peace. But the name of the game is everybody's playing off this. And then you see uh, on the news, they show you where the shopping carts are when people take them back afterwards. There's like 20 and 30, 20 and 30 sterile gloves. People just take off and throw on the ground. It's like, what the heck are you doing? You know, I mean, you wouldn't be seen dead without them. <clears throat> and the funny thing is, is, you see people driving a car and they're wearing gloves. They're driving along and they go like. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they got their gloves on. You know, yeah. you know I understand those I know. gloves are foul. those gloves are foul now. Yeah. And I, you know, I taught first aid for twenty years, and I'm I'm well versed with 
sterility and the and the rules. And I, you know, a friend of mine just came back. Another hypnotist just came back from Asia. She spent a month traveling around, and all of them were mouth guards. It's just the thing there. She says, you know what? I don't touch my nose anymore on my face because when you get a mouth guard on, it's hard to. So I just learned to get out of the habit. That's the name of the game is get out of the habit. <clears throat> but there's fear that people have, they run around. And then it goes on top of all the fears that they have, but life fears. Um, and on one hand, people are saying, excuse me, <clears throat> on one hand, people are saying, you know, I really love being home with my wife and my kids and my family. This is so wonderful. And then on the other hand of that, they're saying, but I don't know how the hell I'm going to pay for this because you can't get paid forever. You know, and the corporations are going to, but you have to drop that fear. The government uh, in Canada were very, very lucky. The federal government will give you $2,000 a month to, to help with things. And if, you know, if you've loaded up the, your mortgage and it costs you $5,000 a month a list to, to live, maybe it's time to second think how you're, how you're living here. Do you need the big house? Do you need the four cars? I mean, all the rest that sort of stuff. I'm mean, like a live in a in a in a hut at the back as long as I had high speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we but, can keep um, working. <laughs> and the other the other part of that is I just have to get people to take my word for it. I have been trusted. <clears throat> I've been honored to be trusted by close to 900 families over the last uh, number of years to um, um, to uh, present the uh, celebration of life services for their loved ones. And, and you know what, I mean, let me, let me give this to the doubters. When I first started to do um, funeral services, I'm sitting with the family, I'm doing a debrief. How would you like it? What would you like said? What would you not like said? Do you want prayers? Do you not want prayers? You know, sort of thing. And who's going to speak? And as we were going through the order of service, 900 families, close to 900 families, and almost every single one, and I never asked at the beginning, uh, would say, well, I know he's okay because <clears throat> he came to sleep with me last night with his arm around me like we always did. And he was gone in the morning, but I know he's okay. Then the kids are looking at each other saying, uh, I think mom needs some meds. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that happened, uh, I mean, every, almost every single time. So I don't think that 900 uh, family members uh, in the hereafter all got together and said, Character, gather around, guys. Listen, do you want to screw up Reverend Tim? Let's all tell him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I mean, it, it's happened to all these people that their loved ones have come to them in some way, shape, or form, and they they exert their energy. And every human being is a mass of energy. We usually run on twenty watts. We know from science, and it could go as high as sixty or one hundred and twenty in extreme emotional situations. So you use that energy, which cannot be destroyed or dissipated, can only be changed. And they use that energy to try to get through to you, through this frosted glass window. So if you like to, um, you know, if, if people would like to speak to their loved ones, all they got to do is just sit down and think. Go to a, go to a hypnotist, a hypnotherapist, <clears throat> have them show you how to really get into state, meditative state quickly. And you practice it in an armchair every night and for 20 minutes you can sit down and you can chat to your loved ones and probably not as well as a, as a trained psychic and medium but that comes with time but if nothing else your loved ones they're listening to you and they can hear you every time you speak about them say you know what uh, i sure miss my dad and dad's there and all of a sudden he goes uh oh, god bless him I didn't think you liked me that much. <laughs> <laughs> but they know. They know that. But they know that they can't get back to you because you've got this wall of grief around you, which is, and the grief wall is a heavy one. You know, spirit can't get through it very easily at all, which is why we it's do. It's lovely it. working with clients to let their grief go. And yet people feel guilty. Then you have to work with that about letting yeah. grief go because for some reason we have to carry it for a long time. That's the belief, right? Well, um, there's two aspects to that. For me, uh, having worked with so many, grief is not something I'm going to adjust the hypnotherapeutically. Mm -hmm. Grief is something that has to dissipate by itself, depending on the psychology of that person. But if there's any effects of the grief that are screwing up their day, 
I can work with those and change yeah. those, and yeah. change your attitude on it. But grief itself will yeah, disappear that, naturally by itself. And yeah, just the, a it's a word we're talking about, but uh, we're agreed on that. So, um, so four, we only have four minutes left. And I think I asked you to do a certain uh, little tidbit. <coughs> Um, you know, if you want to make yourself feel good, this is funny because I was uh, meeting a friend of mine, people who know down, know Toronto on the highway system. So I was meeting a friend for lunch, a psychotherapist. So I, I go south on the 410, along the uh, 401, down the 427, along the Queenie to go into Toronto, and it's highway all the way. And like I'm going 120, 130, 140 kilometers, by the way, behind you, going like, you know, because you're not going fast enough for them. So they come around and then they cut in front of you. And normally, the first thing that I want to say to them is not something God fearing, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I just thought, what the heck? So what I started to say when when it happened, it happened four times. Like people cut me off, I would shout at them through my car. I love you. <laughs> And then I get down to lunch and I get out of the car and I walk in, I sit at the table and my friend Peter says, what do you have such a stupid looking smile on your face for? What have you, what, what, what's happened? And I told him what had happened. And I'm like, I felt absolutely wonderful. I felt great. I felt terrific. And I said, and I'm, and I'm already giggling away. And he says, I'm going to start, I'm going to start getting my clients to do that. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's the choice, right? Which way are you going to react? You took yeah. the choice. You took the high road and made you feel really great. Yeah. But, you know, for the majority of people out there who perhaps haven't experienced it yet, um, go to a reputable hypnotherapist and say, look, I want to just walk in and say, I want to be happy. I want to be happier than I am now. <laughs> That's all you have to say. And they say that, no problem. Let's do some ego enhancement or let's do this or let's do that. You don't even have to tell them what your problem is or what your issue is. You don't even have to tell them because we can work with the subconscious where we don't know what your issue is we don't care the subconscious knows what it is and the subconscious will adjust it for you today so mm -hmm. that and i always say <clears throat> i don't care what sort of a good mood you're in whenever you come to uh, to my office for uh, a session i guarantee that you'll leave here feeling markedly better than when you first came in that's the only guarantee i get you and then you know it, it happens and i they come back the second time I say, so I had to feel when you left her. And he says, you know, I went, I went home that night. Now things weren't that bad. And so that's what we do. We minimize negativity. We're here to have the subconscious do what it's there to do, which is make you feel good, make you feel better, and not give up. We cannot give up knowing that we're here for a reason and that you can be happy. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to carry other people's stuff. Be, be happy. Why not? What I mean, you can still be a professional and be happy. <laughs> still walk around and be happy. I don't yeah. know how, but <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't let stuff like Trump and don't let body him. All this, all this people making dire predictions that you're going to die. You walk outside, you're going to die. You touch somebody else, you're going to die. Oh, please, Lord. You know, I mean, if that was meant to be, I'd. There'd be art. There'd be an arc somewhere in my street. People say, "Okay, get ready," because <laughs> yeah. well, I always say, you know, there's uh, we all have an expiry date, whatever yeah. that is, and when it is. So why just bother being afraid of everything? You can choose to just let go of that fear and be happy. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I mean, the day that God says, "Okay, Tim." <clears throat> I need you up here to do that stuff now. I'm happy with it. I'm absolutely happy to go. But I've got things to do while I'm here. Yeah. While I'm doing these I things that, that I've been mandated to do or I've chosen to do, I'm happy about it. I'm happy doing funerals. I love my funerals <clears throat> because I know I'm helping another family <clears throat> move their way through the worst experience in their life. Well, I hate to say this, we're coming to closer to the end of the show. And I have to say, it's been a blast. I love the show. You did such a nice job with telling people those stories that are so important for them to hear. Uh, it's all because of him. They gave me everything. Yes, I agree. I agree. All right. So uh, I'm just going to have to say goodbye for now. And goodbye to everybody. And we'll see you next week on Hypnosis Everywhere. Thanks very much. 
I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> All right, you're clear. Thanks very much. Great job, everybody. We'll yeah. talk to you next week. Okay. Thanks, Josh.